All right, score stories with Mike Mulligan. <laughs> oh, my God. We've been looking forward to this. Thank you for doing it. So Danny's like, uh, earlier today we were talking about, okay, so what were the early shows? And I'm like, well, I remember producing Mully on the weekend, like a Saturday afternoon. Oh, Mully, yeah. right, right, you, and I, I don't even remember who was in the one chair. Was it a rotation? Was it Lester Munson sometimes? Who was it? it well, I, Who'd you work with on a I, Saturday afternoon? It, was, I, it wasn't even a set thing. I, I So I was working at Sporting News Radio, as you recall, Matt, yes. and I had been doing... I had been doing fill-in stuff at the score, and I I finally got a um, a contract at Sporting News Radio, and then I ended up having an opportunity to go on with um, with uh, Dan Jiggets. That there that's when Mac left the first time. I was kind of offered that job, and I was going to do that, but I had already signed a contract with Sporting News Radio, and they were reluctant to let me out of it, and then I. I gave a copy of that to the great Ron Gleason, and he was kind of like, "Well, you know, talk to them, see if you can get out of it." <laughs> like they, they were, they didn't think that I could, and it, you know, I ended up just working at Sporting News Radio, so I missed an opportunity to be on the score many years before. Um, I wound up working at Sporting News Radio, and I did that for a few years, and then I, I signed a deal with the score, and I was told. Um, you know, my first shift was going to be Saturday at like noon or something. And I, I came in and um, I was sitting there. I had like, there were a couple of high school kids. I don't think you were producing the show. And I, I didn't even know how to punch up a call. I didn't even know how the phones worked. And Lawrence had just finished the shift and he taught me, uh, you know, hit this one, but make sure you do this. And I mean, I was hanging up on people like crazy. It was a disaster. But I did a show on the weekends. I was kind of a fill in guy. So I would just fill in wherever. And I did, I worked for Terry, I worked for Dan, I worked for, you know, uh, with Mike uh, North, with whomever needed somebody at that particular time. And then I didn't really have a set saturday show but i worked pretty much every saturday or sunday whatever time i was told to come well in. i have extremely fond memories of producing you um in my sporadic shifts you were interesting you knew your stuff you were a grizzled newspaper guy willing to tell stories um and 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 i also remember one time when this station went off the air for some weird technical reasons and i just started playing random music just to like <laughs> Just to like pass the time, and we hung out and we listened to James Brown's funky people for like forty I, minutes. You remember that? I went. I not only do I remember it, I went out and got the the uh, the two CDs. I got James Brown Funky People Part One and James Brown Funky People Part Two, and they became part of my rotation, man. I I still listen to that. That that is those are people that were in the band with him, right? Yes, and that's what you told me at the time. I I gotta tell you, that, like that was phenomenal that was one i mean i'm not even kidding it was like the first time you heard something that just totally appealed to you you know i've always been more of a kind of soul fan and an r&b yeah i love those i love those uh albums absolutely fantastic yeah, that was that was a time when i was working at a record store at the same time old inside track on armitage and somebody hipped me to it there and i immediately oh. bought them and like brought them in i love that that you remember that yeah absolutely so many oh. people have made at, at this station and others uh, when sport, you know, newspapers were lo around a lot longer, Mully, uh, than than sports radio. What was your? Because some people quit the newspaper cold turkey. Some people right. were like, "I want to do both because I don't trust this radio thing." Some people still don't trust this radio thing. Some people look down on the radio thing. What was your relationship with? newspaper and radio as you made the gradual transformation and to eventually full-time radio powerhouse yeah i i um I, so i was in i started working at the sun times when i was 18 i i got a job answering phones um for the prep department for taylor bell and so i started you know i was a freshman in college i went to loyola and i would come down on weekends you know i played soccer but in the in the uh, off season, my buddy Danny Cahill got me a job answering phones at the Sun Times, and I, I so I went in and I answered phones, filled in for someone a couple times, and then the next thing you know, 
um, I started covering games and I would go out to these like high school basketball games and I didn't have a car. So I would take the L all over Chicago. And I got, I remember coming out of Englewood high school and I got like, these guys were throwing stuff at me and screaming and I took off and I like tore my jeans trying to climb over a fence to just get away. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, you know, in the winter it would be <laughs> fine. It didn't matter what area you went into. You could just get off the L and walk or get a bus and walk. But I went to all the, the, uh, super cool, um, inner city games, you know, it was just a wonderful gig. And, um, so I, I knew pretty much, by the time I was like a sophomore or junior in college that I wanted to be a sports writer. And when I got out of um, school, I ended up just kind of hanging around the sports department until I got a job, uh, you know, until they hired me full time. And I, um, I worked for Taylor for a long time and then became kind of, you know, I was the guy writing the roundups and writing game stories that people would call in and stuff. And then um, they finally, the union interceded and made all of the full-time uh, people like Daryl Van Schauen, uh, myself, Mark Potash. There were a lot of us that were working for Taylor that were working full-time, but we were not getting, you know, full-time benefits. We weren't in the union. So we ended up getting into the union. And then from that point, I was like, I think it was a year and a half. I went from um, covering preps to covering the bulls. Wow. You know, it's so interesting because there's sort of a, a linear progression to newspaper life in some of those stories, right? Where you, you start wherever, you do what you have to do, and you build it up. Once you're an established newspaper guy, then you become a radio guy. How do you... How, how do you craft a radio show? Like how you know, how yeah. do you and how do you and Brian Hanley create what you created? When we all know that some producers can help, some bosses can help, but a lot of times you're on your own with this stuff. Yeah, it, you know, I, I it's so weird to think back on it now because you know you begin as a radio guest. You basically are a right. guy that you know they call you and you you know yeah okay I'll do that it's fine, and um, so. You know, I think the first radio show I was on was Chet Kopic, and I was covering something or other, and they called me up, and I did it, and he called me Milligan the entire time, right? So it's about right. It's like he just misnamed me, and I didn't, I didn't have the heart to correct him. But then, you know, the more you were kind of doing like guest appearances, you would occasionally do like a fill-in type thing, and then, um, you know, it just kind of it, there was a natural sort of a synchronicity and when i still remember when the score started right so i was working at the paper i mean it wasn't you know it, it, it no one was quite sure what it was and it was you know the it was just kind of um amazing the way that mike north kind of became this star and it was you know he was obviously came from the hot dog stand and you know knew something about laying bets etc and it was pretty extraordinary to watch how that all started. And the, like the next thing you know, you're kind of sitting there and, and Mike is like half in the bag asking Pat Riley a question during the Knicks series. You know, you're like, <laughs> what? You know, did just, you, did you look down on it? Um, I, you know, I, honestly, I had deadlines. It wasn't looking down on it. It was like, knock off the nonsense. We got to get the hell out of here. You know, we got to write and get hit by deadlines. That that was the only, I found it, you know, I, I actually got along with, with everybody. And, you you know, th there were guys that were around forever. You know, George Offman, I knew from whenever I first began. And then all of a sudden, they're wearing nicer clothes. You know, it was like people were, <laughs> were getting gigs with the with right. radio. And, and it was... Uh, a totally different deal but you know i like even when we took over um to answer your question matt it, it, like i'm a i'm a total like i love research and i love to look stuff up i i remember driving up to northwestern to go through their bookstore to try to find like radio stuff and there wasn't anything and i went to the university of chicago i tried loyola's bookstore i i like tried very hard the, the internet wasn't going around wow. at that point and i tried to get information and it took a very long time and it was joe ostrowski who like lent me this book 
that a guy had written about how to be a radio producer. And it was, there was so much information in that that helped a ton for me to understand radio. I did not come through the, the same path that people would take now. So I, I felt like I had gaps of knowledge and needed kind of information. Wow. Pretty good stuff. That's fa it's fascinating. It's what, it's what a curious researcher does. You f try to figure out a way to, to learn it, you know? It's We're talking to Mike Mulligan for Score Stories, brought to you by EOC Audio. Check out their showroom in Lyle, eocaudio.com. Uh, as someone who's been a radio guy my whole career, Spieg's radio guy, like there's this fear aura around mornings. People are like, morning radio. It'll take years off your life or morning radio. You never get used to it. Have you gotten used to morning radio? Yeah, probably. I mean, I, you know, guys, I got three kids. I haven't like, I haven't run my game in probably 25 years. You know what I mean? Like what, what else am I going to do? So I, I think you just learn kind of the discipline of how to go about doing morning radio. I remember, you know, when we were starting our show with Brian and myself, uh, and when and we did like a two hour show while we were both sports writers, and then we ended up taking over when Mike North left. And, you know, it was just this unbelievable opportunity. And um, and we kind of would come into work and, and you would see, you know, we were next to XRT. So we, we had, you know, a great, we had great people that we could talk to about what it was like. And I still remember being told like, you know, you, you hope to feel normal one day in a row. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. And it was, and I laughed at that, but it is, it is a weird thing. It's, it does change your whole life. You are, you know, you, if you're a vampire ever, you know, and you like late nights and all that, it pretty much <laughs> erases all that. And you, and you learn that you got to get sleep and you learn that you got to work out and you got to try to watch how you're treating yourself because it takes a toll and <laughs> it is definitely taking a toll over the years. You, you, you told me a joke, Molly, that I've, that I've repeated. Um, and, and although I can't tell it, if it were a Jewish joke, I could tell it, but it was an Irish joke that you, that you told me that was, um, uh, two guys are having a fight um, outside a bar, and the Irishman walks up and says, "Hey, uh, is this a private fight, or uh, can I can I join? Can anyone join it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that is that sad reality. Well, you know, the, I, it, I, the, I don't know. The, the Irish, a lot of guys are well balanced. They got a chip on both shoulders. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I probably fall into that category. I, I think I'm not." as affable as maybe I appear to be when I'm doing the show. I'm probably a moodier, darker, brooding Irish guy as opposed to a happy, you know, I, I don't drink. You'll fit right I in in radio. I rarely get a drink. Yeah. I, yeah, well, I mean, none, of, none of us are as affable as, as we appear to right. be. Right. You know, right. I, I've, except, yeah. well, except Danny, Danny's not affable. Well, Danny is lovely. <laughs> but no, no, Danny's <laughs> figured out. He doesn't even pretend to be affable. It's brilliant. Just me. Actually. Just uh, me. But, you know, I just, I, one of my favorite score stories, like Doug Buffon was an affable person, was a really good man and was a guy that like salt of the earth. You just, you, the more you got to know Doug, the better you liked them. And I worked with Doug and I shared an office with Doug and we were doing the show when he choked out Bernstein. And I still <laughs> wow. will never forget that as long as I live because Doug was, you know, played how many years in the NFL? And and Bernstein was giving him a hard time, and Doug wasn't in the mood for it. And and I knew when I came in that day he wasn't in a good mood. And, you know, and you, Doug would never show it. And Bernstein kept saying things to him like, you know, oh, it, Doug said to him a couple times, he pointed at him, and he said, say that again, I'm going to come over there. And Bernstein would say, well, the good thing is you're so concussed, you'd forget why you came over the minute you got up. Oh. And, and he kept And he kept repeating that sort of thing. And, and like, it wasn't fun and Doug wasn't having it. And so finally Bernstein made another comment after, I think it was the third one. And Doug, it was like watching like a giant cat, like a giant, <laughs> I mean, like a, like a dangerous kind of you know, mountain lion of a man. He got up and he was around, he, he was like, I was sitting, we were back in the old studio, there would be two people on one side and two people on the other when you're doing crosstalk. 
Doug came around me and had Bernstein and chokehold before, like I could even stand up myself. I, I was, you've never seen a guy move like that. And he and Bernsey, God bless him, he just he didn't try to fight back. He just kind of went rubber in the chair. And I'm standing there, and I I'm like I didn't touch Doug because he was like twitching with every muscle in his body. And I kept saying, I'm like. Doug, he's turning purple. He's going to turn blue, Doug. Like, I, I thought he was going to kill him, like, accidentally, you know? And he just he just let him go. And Bursty goes down in a heap. And Doug walks out the studio. And I go walking out after him. And I'm not kidding you. He is, like, twi twi twitching. He oh. was so – and he turns to me. And he said, I didn't play piano for a living. And I and I thought to myself, like, wow. my God, Doug could kick my ass. Like that guy, he could beat up anybody here or anybody, any collection of people. Like you've never seen a guy that just responded like that. It was you saw the Neanderthal gene. It was a great moment. I didn't that play is a piano. Great score moment. I didn't play piano for a living. That's amazing. I never heard that. Oh but yeah, that's yeah. That, that's the postscript. Yeah. That is so good. But that's the dynamic in so many locker rooms for decades, and of yep. course at this place. Where you get people thinking, well, I know all about these games. I can talk about it. And occasionally get people who actually played the game. That, that's the essence of it on some level. Right. I mean, he, he, it was, it was amazing to see that part of Doug, which you didn't see all the time. But he would be like, he, I, he'd be coming in. He'd be like, oh, I worked out. You know, I'm just hitting the heavy bag. Like, that's how he worked out. He had like a big bag. He'd go home and beat the hell out of it. You know, <laughs> I mean, Good God, it, it was extraordinary. And and my cousin had come over from England at one point, and my cousin Martin is like the oldest of the Mulligans' cousins, and he is probably five six, maybe you know, a buck five, a buck ten. He's the little fella, and the two of us would hang out together, and it was absurd looking, you know. It was just it, it be apparently we're getting you know more of the of the uh we're not getting the grass-fed beef over here or something because it didn't make sense that, that we'd be related but i took him with me to do this thing that doug had arranged and we get out to this place and doug walks up and and he he turns to martin and he says hey uh, marty how you doing and he slaps him on the back and i swear to god i think he knocked him down it was like <laughs> it was hysterical but doug was just the, one of the strongest guys ever so I mean, man, we could talk to you for hours. You're, I, I said it when we were teasing it earlier. You're one of the best storytellers I've ever heard on radio. It's just, it's fantastic. I feel like we should have let, just let him go more. Oh, uh, well, I, I know. Like, so can, can we do some like rapid fire favorites? Like, do, do you sure. do, do you have favorite guest or guest memory in, in your time at the score? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we recently had Gretzky on with Chelios. And that's one of my favorites ever because that guy was such a prince to me when I was doing like backup writing stuff. So I mean, that was that, a cool moment. That was a really fun moment just because it, it reminded me of like a great moment. Um, you know, I, I mean, Doug, uh, Doug was just so much fun because he was friends with guys like OB and and with uh, Butkus and, and OB. I was doing a show one Saturday and I was making fun of Butkus as an actor. I don't know if you ever saw him when he was in that show. Yep. And, uh, and OB calls me and he's like, hey, I was driving through Chicago talking to uh, to Dick, and he heard what you say. He wants you. He wants you to call him. He wants to talk to you about his acting career. And I was like, I was like, oh mother of God, what have I done? You know? <laughs> uh, but, so I mean, those old kind, old time bear guys. You know, the guys you watched. You know, when when I when I talked to Belton Bill Melton the first time, mm. I was like, I, that guy was like a childhood hero to me. Like I just remember him hitting these home runs and tape measure shots and stuff. So you just like things like that are on, and Doug Buffon. You know it's incredibly cool to to know people that you watched as a kid and to and to you know get to know them a little bit. I took my son to training camp one time and he said, like we were talking to uh, to to Bill Melton and he said that I my like my whole demeanor everything about me changed and I was just like hi Mr. Melton like I was so excited you know because you're you know all, we start out as as sports fans so that's uh, that's magnificent stuff we've had you know there's been so many people and I you know 
I, I mean, Dave wants that. You guys got to know him very well. Oh, You've got so a great, great relationship with him. Um, he, I knew Dave. I covered Dave, and I had uh, just so much fun getting to know him and, and staying in touch with him over the years. Just a great person. 